sure first that this similar parties question has been taken in the recent past, and this have to be given to the acknowledgement to Dr. Kalamama. The question goes as follows. A 27-year-old man weighs 127 kilogram, height of 1.6 meter, developed exertional dyspnea since six months ago, no cough, smokes 10 sticks per day for 10 years, no family history of diabetes, hypertension, lung cancer, or COPD. Lung function test showed a restrictive pattern. The first question is, what is the diagnosis? What is the cause of his symptoms? What test will you do to evaluate him? And how will you manage him? The salient points here include young male with BMI of 45.4 kilogram per meter square, belonging to the obesity class three, having exertional dyspnea, smoking history with five pack years, and restrictive lung pattern. So in this particular case, the diagnosis based on the first question is obesity, hypoventilation syndrome, which was previously known as Pickwickian uh, uh, syndrome. Obesity hypoventilation syndrome is defined as the presence of a weak alveolar hypoventilation, uh, evidenced by arterial pressure of carbon dioxide of greater than or equal to 45 millimeter of mercury in an obese individual with body mass index greater than or equals to 30 kilogram per meter square which cannot be attributed to other conditions associated with hypoventilation. And it's said to be characterized by ob obesity, triad of obesity, sleep disorder, uh, breathing, and chronic daytime hypoventilation. So the quest second question was a uh, cause of the, the symptoms. When we look at the symptoms majorly here, as regards to this particular question, it is mainly directed to exertional uh, dyspnea. And the pathogenesis that has helped to explain these particular symptoms include obesity, which is the major risk factor. It is said to cause increased work of breathing, which is the breathing mechanism. mechanism. Uh, ordinarily, it's not all patients with ob or, or obesity that will definitely progress to obesity type of, uh, ventilation syndrome. However, in some cases, because there are compensatory, compensatory mechanisms that help in those that are obese in order to meet up with their ventilation uh, requirements. However, when patients now progress to uh, obesity hyperventilation syndrome, this particular compensatory mechanism is normally a uh, loss. And as a result, it worsens a uh, work of breathing and is part of the reason responsible for patients who have developed exertional dyspnea. Other explanation associated with obesity is that fat accumulation around the um, uh, uh, abdomen and the chest wall contribute to the restrictive effect or the restrictive deficit that is being seen in them, thereby causing ventilation uh, impairment. It has also been said that ventilation perfusion mismatch has also been seen in patients that are obese. And as a result of that, the lower lobe of the lung is poorly ventilated as against a uh, perfusion, which is highly perfused, causing mismatch in this particular category of patients. Another reason that has been attributed to the patients are uh, this dyspnea is impaired ventil ventilatory control, which is due to reduced new, uh, neural drive and respiratory uh, responsiveness. Another important point that has also been associated to this is leptin resistance or with uh, absence of retin in the particular patient. Retin is a adenokine that has helped to improve respiration. However, in this category of patients, there are reduction in either leptin or even when retin is present, the receptor is not responding well to it, making it to be resistant, and thereby leading to redu reduced ventilation, causing hypercapnia and hypoxemia. Heart failure in these patients is also another complication that has been attributed to 
patients with obesity hypoventilation syndrome. And we all know when a failure uh, setting, be it the left or the right, with both coming together, patients will definitely uh, develop exertional dyspnea, particularly if it is the left heart failure. Pulmonary hypertension is also what has been seen in patients with obesity hypoventilation syndrome and is from hypoxemic induced pulmonary vessel constriction. So in a nutshell, pathogenesis that are responsible for this particular symptom in this patient include obesity, impaired ventilatory control, leptin resistance, heart failure, and pulmonary hypertension. The third question is which tests are you going to do in order to uh, evaluate this particular patient? The first bedside evaluation is doing pulse oximeter, doing pulse oximetry, in which hypo hypoxia will be detected, thereby the SpO2 will always be less than 90%. The second test that has been employed is arterial blood gas. And when we look at the definition of hypovent uh, op uh, op uh, obesity hypoventilation syndrome, we'll see that we talked about hypercapnia with PaCO2 greater than or equals to 45 millimeter of mercury. And this can quickly be detected using the arterial blood gas. EU and creatinine is also very important. In fact, it has been one of those things that we can say that all patients with obesity hypoventilation syndrome usually come down with a HCO2 that is greater than 27 millimeter of, uh, millimole per liter and is said to be a sensitive screening because it is about 97, 92 to 97% in terms of sensitivity, but less specific with 50%. And it is said that it has a high negative predictive factor, predictive value. When we observe that it's less than 27 millimole per liter, we can say confidently that the patient is not having OHS, which is the obesity hypoventilation syndrome. Another important test is doing full blood count. But what is mainly being employed is the PCV, in which patients normally have polycythemia, which is in response to the chronic hypoventilation and hypoxia that patients develop. Pulmonary function test is another important modality of investigation that is being derived, uh, deployed in evaluating the category, this category of patients. And what is usually being seen is restrictive lung pattern. However, that doesn't totally rule out that we can see another uh, lung function pattern in them. In fact, it has been said that in some particular of patients, we even have normal lung function pattern, but that do does not totally exclude the presence of OHS in that particular patient. Chest X-ray is also very important, and this is when we see elevation of both hemidiaphragms, and we can also see cardiomegaly and if there is other lung pathology, there may also be lung infiltrates. ECG, very important, where we see right ventricular hypertrophy, right axis deviation, right bundle, uh, bundle branch block, all telling us about that the right part of the heart is mainly affected. Echo, also discussing, telling us about the, how we have the right atrium and right ventricular enlargement, having right ventricular dysfunction and diastolic dysfunction pulmonary hypertension, all these can also be uh, seen while echocardiography is being done. As it is being seen that about 90% of patients with OHS are also having OSA, which is the obstructive sleep apnea. So it is very important to do OSA probability pretest, which is the airport sleep, uh, sleepiness uh, scale, or the Berlin questionnaire. If this is being employed, the airports will help to really know if patient is having this comorbidity in addition to OHS. Sleep study is also very important because as I said earlier, that OHS is a trial that consists of not only obesity, we also have sleep, uh, disorder, sleep disorder also, which using sleep study will help us to know what actually uh, the pattern is and the severity. Thyroid function test, this has also been uh, 
obesity hypovertilation syndrome has been associated with hypothyroidism. Brain imaging, toxicology are also very important. So the next question is, how are we going to manage these patients? And line of management is first to do this examination, investigation, and treatment. For history, it's very important to establish if the patient is having daytime sleepiness or hypersomnolence, if the patient is witnessing a snoring, nocturnal choking, or an apnea. If there's early morning headache, daytime fatigue, impaired concentration, and memory. If there's symptoms of right, uh, right heart failure or left heart failure, or if there are other comorbidity, or if patient is having myalgia, which is involving the chest, chest, neck, and shoulder. For examination, want to examine the BMI. As we know that the cutoff is 30. So for patient that is not up to 30, we may not be able to make this diagnosis. So we have to calculate the BMI, look for the right uh, heart failure from the signs the patient presents with. By ventricular failure and other system examination, for comorbidities, mini mental state examination, motor examination, and the like. For investigations, as previously said, all those investigations is just to rule out or to support uh, the particular diagnosis. In terms of management, also, treatment is multidisciplinary. We need to contact obesity experts, sleep experts, and pulmonary experts. All these people work and, and in order to really make a good diagnosis and treatment of the particular patient. The first line treatment is the non-invasive positive airway pressure, which is the CPAP or the BiPAP. So it's the for patient that come down with OHS, the main uh, positive airway pressure that is being used is the CPAP and is a typical mode of OHS in addition to obstructive sleep apnea. But by level uh, positive airway pressure can also be used in spontaneous time mode if CPAP is, is not tolerated or fails. Another important modality is weight loss, which is very important. Because the more the patient loss with the symptoms get reduced and complication is also averted. Second line treatment is accused to me, but it's not all patients that will benefit from this particular treatment. Medical treatments are really adjuncts. They are not a definitive treatment for the management of our obesity hypoventilation syndrome. So part of those things that have been employed, in addition to weight loss, lifestyle modification, and the non-invasive ventilatory therapy, I include respiratory stimulants, bronchodilators, uh, corticosteroids, pulmonary muscle relaxant, antifilial regimen, depending on what the blood pressure of the patient and whatever presentation patient has. Antilipidemia is also very important, weight loss medication, and in definitive management, if all the above do not work, is the uh, bariatric surgery. I really appreciate and acknowledge using slides of Dr. Kal Kalamama. This is where we end for now. Thank you. Um, thank you so, so much, Dr. Larry Rogers, for that presentation. So now we take comments and questions from the participant first, and then our teachers will come in. And then let's give the thanks coming on the chat. Okay, so there's a comment on the chat from Dr. Vavodu to the presentation. Uh, CPOP is not an NIV. Okay, Chief, okay, just take note. CPOP is not a form of non-invasive uh, Deletion. I think I didn't get that, ma. Okay, CPAP is not if you know you use, put it under non-invasive ventilation. Okay. It's not a form okay. of yes. Oh, it's it's okay. oxygenation, so it's not a form of non-invasive ventilation. So it's BiPAP, as a NIV. Okay, so just like you said, where CPAP pills can use NIV or when a patient has excessive hypercapnia or in you know, a and AHI, that's um, apnea, hypopnea index, greater than 30. Um, sorry, uh, either you want to use the NIV, that's BIPAP. Thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. Okay, so okay, if you like to make a comment, can raise your electronic hand. Okay, so uh, Dr. Ola Roger, you have a lot of applause on the chat. Dr. Amadi Ilombu is saying thank you, Dr. Kalama, excellent presentation. 
Dr. Yahya, Dr. Musa, Dr. Timitope, Dr. Arada. Everyone is applauding you, Dr. Blessing and Madi says, thanks so much for your wonderful presentation. The question that stated that parametry showed a restrictive pattern. Please, how does OHS cause a restrictive pattern? Okay, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. As it has been said, the, the complication that comes with OHS is not, is, is, it's also involved cardiopulmonary. And evidence has shown, I don't, I don't know how I can talk about the pathogenesis, how it leads to it. However, many patients with OAS, about 50% have shown that the lung pattern is really restrictive lung pattern. Some really come with normal lung pattern, lung function tests, but that doesn't totally exclude that the patient is having OHS, OHS as has been previously discussed. But for major patients that have been done, what is being seen is the restrictive lung pattern. And this is what I'm now, the pattern is what I've uh, projected to see that the uh, FEV1 over FVC is greater than 0.7. Zero, and the vital capacity is reduced, while the total lung capacity is also uh, really reduced. Thanks. I don't know if our respiratory uh, physician has more to say about this. Thank you. All right. Thank you so so much. Okay, just to add to that, any pathology that causes a um, compromise of lung compliance or lung expansion will cause a restrictive pattern. So like in obesity, hypoventilation syndrome, because the excess acknowledgement of fat, you know, around the chest wall and even in the abdomen, you know, it restricts the movement of the diaphragm, which is a major muscle of, of respiration. So any pathology at all that will cause reduction in lung compliance or lung expansion will cause a restricted pattern. So that's like one of the uh, patho uh, pathophysiologic mechanisms you listed on one, one of the slides. You know, so the obesity kind of compromises respiratory mechanics. So, mechanics. so any condition at all, even um, you have neuromuscular condition, will cause a restrictive pattern of spirometry. Okay, just to add to that. Thank you so much. So I don't know if Thank I have more too. comments. Okay, so I can't see any other comments. Just a lot of applause yeah. to you on the chat. Okay, so I'll hand over to our teachers. Mark Christopher. Hello, thank you so much, the presenter. That was quite elaborate. Thank you so much. And I love the way you you gave kudos to what's it called? You appreciated the efforts of uh, Dr. Kalamama. That's that's really wonderful. Keep it up. Uh, for my end, it did well. I don't know if any of our teachers have any any more comments. Chief Chito, Chief Cookie, Chief. Amigos, Fatima, Okopi, any comments? Any comments, you can see any comments. You can go ahead, Chief Christopher. Okay, that's fine. So thank you, Dr. Dr. or Larry Wanju. Thank you so much. That was quite wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Kale, you can go ahead with the next presenter. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Ma. Okay, so Dr. Corey, uh, we can go ahead. Good morning, teachers and colleagues. Um, I don't know whether you see my screen. I can see it, but it's not a slideshow. Hello? I can see the screen, but it's not my show.
Can I see it now? Yes, I can see it on some slides. You can go ahead. I can hear you. Okay. I'm trying to remove this from here. It's not, um, is it disturbing my. Okay, I'm coming. We can see your slides clearly now, and they are moving. What's the issue? Okay. Let me. There's this um, upper part, something is obstructing it. Because me not to see clearly. Let me just. Uh, we were not seeing it though. Are you not seeing? It? Okay. <laughs> we are seeing um, your slide clearly. Okay. All right. Um, coming now. Okay. Good morning, teachers and colleagues, members of the class. Um, I will pre I'm presenting a question two B. A question goes this way, that a two-year-old man, medical officer in your hospital emergency department with history of fever of two-day duration, associated with generalized weakness, he took admittance of train and NSAID with no relief. He developed cough and NSAID, sorry. He developed cough and took amoxicillin community acid with no relief. Two days later, he noticed headache, sore throat, tinkling in the ears and rash. A colleague asked him to see you to sort him out. Mention four other questions you would like to ask him. List four differential diagnoses. What is the most likely diagnosis? What are the what are the risk factors for acquiring this illness? Okay. Um, what is the vector and mode of transmission? How will you investigate the patient? How will you manage him? List four complications and what are the prognostic indices? Okay, um, from the from the um, history, what questions I would like to ask patient is um, include history of having attended to a patient suspected of having lost a fever, an infectious disease, known to manifest in a similar manner. History of recent travel to area known to have an outbreak or lesser lost a fever or similar illness. Close contact with a family member having similar symptomatology and the difficulty or impaired hearing. Okay, question two, different diagnosis. If you include first, we include uh, I, will, I will think about uh, Lassa fever, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus, formerly known as COVID 19 infection, infection mononucleosis, scarlet fever, and others include, may include uh, malaria, Ebola, and measles. And in as much as uh, in Lassa fever, one patient has that's in the history, the so throat, fever, cough, and patient also has a generalized um, weakness and a rash. And then um, in, um, in, this, in the COVID-19 infection, patient may also have patient may also have fever as in the patient cough, shortness of breath, patient may also have a um, loss of taste. About what in the, in the two, what you make me to think more of? Either Lassa fever or COVID nineteen is if there is a, an outbreak with respect to any of this, uh, any of this, any of the illness that would make me, make me to take more to either Lassa fever or this. But in terms of symptomatology, they appear similar, you know, but with little, little difference, you know, especially when there is progression of illness. Then the mono, infection mononucleosis. Um, typically, uh, these patients you really have in addition to the symptoms mentioned above, sore throat and fever, patient may have swollen neck. A swollen a glands in the neck, that is the uh, maxilla, the anterior and posterior cervical roots, may have flows at the axilla, and then, of course, the, uh, the groin. And then uh, um, the sore throat in the infection of the process is always uh, very severe, and patients usually have difficulty in swallowing. And with respect to the scarlet fever, usually caused by beta 2, beta hemolytic, subtichokai. Um, patients may have high, high temperature. And then uh, also have sore throat that um, this characteristic white yellowish yellowish patches, you know, on inspection of the throat. And then patients also, they also have may also come up with um, in enlarged nodes in the neck, 
um, the cervical nodes and all, all this are seen in um, in a infection nucleosis. So, <laughs> okay. Now, the question three: What's the most most likely diagnosis? Uh, uh, look, most likely diagnosis based on what um, you know the the the, the presenting uh, the history uh, is likely to be Lassa fever. Now, what are these factors for acquiring this ANS? Uh, you know, exposure, especially when patient is a, a patient, in this patient is a, is a, is a, is a doctor and they works at a health center, um, medical uh, health center. And we travel to endemic area is another risk factor. Exposure to infected patients. Um, also, exposure or contact rodents, you know, uh, scriptures or excreta. These are risk factors for acquiring the ANS. Then what is the vector question five? The vector uh, is multi-mometer uh, multi transmission is spread through contamination of food, edible items at homes and offices by infected rodents, rodent secretions and uh, feces. And person-to-person -person transmission has been, has been noted that it will commonly of course rather. And investigation here, the question six, how will you investigate the patient? Uh, diagnostic investigation, I want to do a xylic immunosement assay antigen test and immunofluorescence assays. And then uh, the complementary test, we want to, we want to do LASA virus reverse transcriptive polymerase reaction. And cell culture will also be um, necessary for confirmation. Now, the, the, the investigations to do uh, both supportive and other investigations to rule out my differentials, we include full block count, which should demonstrate lymphocytopenia and tuberocytopenia in the setting of LASA fever, and neutrophilic um, lymphocytosis in the setting of where we, if one uh, if a child has um, Infection mode nucleosis and uh, scarlet fever. And then liver function tests will show elevated liver enzymes, fetal transaminase, and the uh, lactate dehydrogenase. Then I also want to do um, a reverse transcriptase PCR for COVID 19 infection. Those were not have no swap culture for infection mode nucleosis. And then other tests are listed here rapid cytokokal test and then for, for, for um, scarlet fever. Metro field test, more specific for a convention of infection mononucleosis can be done. They pick thick and thin thing for malaria test. Seeing as much malaria is a, a strong differential in this patient. Manage infection seven. How do I manage this patient? A proper explanation and counseling will be instituted regarding the likely diagnosis. This will discuss the patient and then discuss with him regarding the line of management and options with respect to isolation, whether he's going to subscribe to home, uh, home isolation. And then our health facility um, isolation setting. And then, uh, uh, in as much as a mild suspected case, mild case of um, possible uh, probable uh, Lassa fever. So, either, either of these can be, can be, uh, can be uh, subscribed to. Then, so we will institute infection preventive measures. Allow the relevant authorities, infectious disease in the team, relevant public health authorities, state epidemiologists. Uh, there's a, a local government surveillance and distribution centers. Contact tracing will be will be will be uh, will be commenced. Then uh, I also want to commence supportive care to this patient. Why well, to hydrate patients and then and of course calorie uh, calorie intake. I'll start him on uh, if actually uh, in the course of depending on how available the the screening the result um, available. I want to start this patient with uh, even with the result has not come out. Hasn't um, have not received the outcome of the test. I want to start the patient on um, reverberin using the oral regimen, loading dose of 100 mg per kg in two divided doses, two to giving start and one to giving uh, eight hours later. The two to the seven, I give to five mg per kg daily uh, for a single dose, and then eight to 10 days, 2.5 mg per kg daily. I will assess patient for possible complications and manage accordingly. The question eight, what are the complications of Lassa fever? Uh, this includes hearing loss, which have been demonstrated up to 30% of patients that, that, that are confirmed to have Lassa fever infection. Pregnancy loss, abortion is also a well, a well noted uh, complication. Injury, kidney kin injury, visual defects or loss, in intellectual disability, and hydrocephalus. These are our identified complications of Lassa fever infection. What are the prognosis indices? This includes viral load. Uh, include viral loads that are still with poor outcome, same with age, advancing age that are still with uh, poor outcome, 
Then also, time from the onset of symptom to hospitalization is also another prognostic indices. And then uh, the presence of magic symptoms is also spells um, a bad outcome. And then organ involvement, the kidneys or the liver and all, and all the, uh, the important organs also um, uh, all pointing towards a poor prognostic outcome. Now, I want to give an abyss fashion of the last, last time you give a um, literature review. I would like to follow okay, this. Chief, yeah. Okay, just definition and all that. Then, uh, Lassa fever, also known as Lassa hemorrhagic fever, is a type of viral hemorrhagic fever caused by Lassa virus. Many of those infected by the virus do not develop symptoms. When symptoms are called, they typically involve, uh, include fever, weakness, headache, vomiting, and muscle pain. Less commonly, there may be bleeding from the mouth to gastrointestinal tract. The risk of death once infected is about 1%, 1 and frequently occurs within two weeks of, um, of the onset of symptoms. Of those who sit within three, three months in about half of, the, of these cases. Then in case definition of Felasa fever, first is a alert case. Any, any person who has an unexplained fever, that is when malaria and other common causes of fever have been uh, ruled out, which or without bleeding, is an alert case. Or a person, a person who died after an unexplained severe illness with fever and severe and bleeding. Okay, especially the suspected case is when a patient which has a fever for three to 21 days with with a major temperature of 38 degrees centigrade or more, with more or, or with one or more of the following vomiting diarrhea, sore throat, major generalized body weakness, abnormal, abnormal bleeding, abnormal, um, abnormal pain. In the neonates, when to make to, to in, in the neonates, when there is maternal lassa fever, you know, it's present plus or minus, it is what well, is really is really um. A pointer to suspect that's how you find the it. Now, any of the following scenarios should raise uh, the index of suspicion of last fever in patients. When, when the patient has not responded to a standard anti malaria treatment, and treatment for other common infectious causes of fever within 48 to 72 hours. When there is history of recent contact with a probable or confirmed case of last fever within 21 days of onset of fever, patient with history of fever and history of travel to a high risk body area. Or Lassa fever, contact with body fluids or tissue of, of a dead patient with a febrile illness. Symptoms and signs highly suggestive of Lassa fever leading to that. Now, in, in the case, when there is in, in the setting of probable case of Lassa fever, uh, uh, a, a, a suspected case who has an, one or more of the following complications is likely a, a, a probable case. When there is hearing loss, facial or neck swelling, Seizures, restlessness, confusion, hypotension, when it's only blood pressure less than 90 mercury in adults or less than 70, and also less than 70 mercury in the children. Or the degree less than when, it's, when they are urinary is less than 0 0.5 mils per kg per hour for six hours. Or when they're abnormal bleeding or any of the following supporting, supporting laboratory features, like um, when there's proteinuria and microscopic material. Elevated urea, less than 45 mg per deal, or creatinine, less than equal to two milligrams per deal. Elevated transaminases, okay, and only this plastic count, less than 90,000 cells per meal. Per meal, per meal, per meal. Then uh, confirmed case, when, uh, when there is when a suspect or probable case with positive laboratory tests using real time preliminary reaction has been done. So when this, the test is really uh, confirmed, um, the test is done and uh, the patient is regarded as a, a, a confirmed case. There are the important things to ask in the history for just a little quick up. Then, when there is history of contact with rats or droppings or history of handling or consumption of rats, all ages are susceptible. Children, pregnant women, adults greater than 40 years, and those who with comorbidities have greater risk of severe illness. Close contact of Lassa, of a Lassa fever patient within three weeks of death, uh, of date of onset of their illness. And receiving health care from a provider who is also training treating patients infected with uh, loss of fever. Surgical partner of a known or suspected case. Uh, these are important things to ask. <laughs> assessment. Usually, the diagnosis is very really difficult. You know, there's early, early diagnosis difficulty. Yeah, because symptoms are not specific. 
uh, that should be highly suspicion to take the examination advice, especially may present with complications. The equivalent period is usually two to one days. And um, the severity of the illness will depend on several factors, including body's immune system, immune response, mode of transmission, duration of exposure, viral infecting those phase of illness in the, in the case, and probably even viral strain. Swollen face, neck, so throat, hearing loss are suggestive of Lassa fever. Said, said that before. And then hemorrhage mark, hemorrhage may occur, may be seen about 20% of Lassa fever patients. The laboratory diagnosis, um, early diagnosis, early laboratory diagnosis of Lassa fever is important to have a good outcome of that outcome with reverberating uh, treatment. This is also important for the early session of uh, appropriate public health control measures. And all samples are must be considered as highly infectious. And then um, confirmatory tests of confirmation of lost fever requires highly specialized laboratories, okay? Um, and with the appropriate biosafety profile. Now, clinical screen and triaging of lost fever. The clinical management of lost patients should be based on classification of cases to either suspected, probable, or confirmed. And then clinical screening criteria is usually when fever occurs more than 48 hours or less than three weeks, or any of the symptoms, any of the symptoms, sore throat, malaise, so, uh, cough, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, residual pain, and uh, as listed there. And then women, of course, when there is um, abnormal vaginal bleeding. Any complications such as encephalopathy, acute kidney injury, spontaneous abortion, uh, these are all confirmed um, serious cases. Travel to endemic areas less than 21 days, and the contact with resident. Since you have contact with other fever patients, less than 21 days before presentation. In the, in the case of suspected case, what we do, we have to put patient in a holding area and then institute infection prevention measures. Allow the relevant authorities, notify relevant public health uh, authorities and they start hydration and of course food therapy necessary. Monitor vital signs every four hours, monitor urinary output, carry out disease analysis for protein and blood. And then um, test for presence of malaria, we mentioned as a part of the differentials. And then uh, do the food block count, including platelet count, serum little record, doing a liver function test, and then the uh, diagnosis testing. Now, probable case, uh, in addition to what listed above, you transfer patient to suspect bay of the treatment unit or center, commence supportive therapy, start treatment to recover, if assess patient with possible complications and man man manage accordingly. Review recovery treatment with the PCR results. And if a state is negative, Continuation of treatment with reverberin is at the discretion of the managing physician. Now, for the confirmed case, patient will transfer to treatment unit and center, commence supportive therapy, uh, continue treatment with reverberin. If patient has, has been on need prior to confirmation of the, of the diagnosis, start treatment with reverberin if, if patient is newly confirmed for Lassa fever. Assess patient for possible complications and then manage accordingly. For severe case, severe Lassa fever, um, Patient is told to, to said to have severe lassa fever infection when there is, if any of the following occurs, when there is acute kidney injury, um, okay, and the severe central nervous system involvement like seizures, confusion, uh, confusion in the state, severe bleeding, respiratory distress, severe anemia, requiring blood transfusion, sepsis of shock. Now the the diagnosis you mentioned it before the diagnostic investigation, confirmatory tests, and then the supportive investigations. But these are things we can do in mild illness and the severe illness, and then um, which may include the uh, ECG for patients suspected of, uh, suspected of precarditis, then the uh, ICP monitoring okay. concussion. Okay, radiological tests, and then um, this can be done including the abdominal or the ultrasound and all, and the, and the and the rest as listed. Other tests based on suspicious suspicion block or support to mean time and block. Blood gases. The frequency of the above investigations for monitoring will depend on the clinical state of patient at presentation and the discussion of the managing physician. Now, the treatment of uh, drug treatment for Lassa fever. The drug of choice for treatment of Lassa fever is intravenous reverberin. Intravenous reverberin is administered over a period of 10 days as seen in the, in the table below. Outcome is more favorable if treatment is commenced within six days of onset of symptoms. They have uh, the McCormick regimen that starts with a loading dose of 13 mg per kg, start, and then this one to four, 16 mg per kg, six hourly, this five to 10, um, eight mg per kg, 
maximum of 0.4 grams in you know, each hourly. And then the Uruguay regimen, you know, loading those 100 milligrams per kg, the two to seven, 25 milligrams per kg, a single day dose, and then single day dose, and then uh, this eight to 10, 2.5, 2.5 milligrams per kg. The monument of patient in, um, uh, monument of uh, last time pregnant women, the general principle are the same, the same, but uh, of course, there should be high, this suspicion is important in this case, of confirmed mass Lassa uh, in pregnancy must be managed in a dedicated Lassa fever treatment center with restricted access to all unauthorized staff. Sweet awareness ICP measures is advised. The nursing care to be provided by training nurses. Nurses express in managing Lassa fever in, in pregnancy. Nurse or patients pregnant women, particularly third trimester in left or last position, commence IV recovery while awaiting PCR results in all probable cases. I'm willing for comorbidities such as malaria and all that, okay? Treat associated complications. If during continuous management, Peter demise, of course, commence immediate evacuation of the uterus. In conclusion, conclusion and prognosis, and prognosis, about 50, 15 to 20 percent of hospital patients with Lassa fever will die from illness. The overall case mortality rate is estimated to be 1 percent, but during epidemics, mortality can go as high as 50 percent. Mortality rate is greater than 80% when it occurs in pregnant women. Fetal deaths also occurs in nearly all those cases. Abortion decreases the risk of death. So survivors experience less deafness. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Leonard, for that beautiful presentation, very detailed. Okay, so now we'll take comments and questions from the participants first, and then our teachers will come in subsequently. Okay, and let's keep the thanks coming on the chat. So a lot of thanks to you. Um, Dr. Leonard, Dr. Lawrence Adeye here says, thank you for the presentation. Please, what's the difference between suspected case and probable case? And then I also like to add my question. So can you talk a little about the pathogenesis? Thank you. I know you go ahead. Okay, maybe you. Uh, go me to the the question of suspected case, uh, it, I actually um, put it down here. And uh, when the patient, um, when the patient has history that's, that actually uh, doesn't really uh, point more towards the last fever, you know, when you have the, the, realize, the normal symptoms of, uh, the last symptoms of fever, malaria, and all that and the um, weakness, that may be a case of uh, a suspected case. But probable case is when the patient already has uh, more of these fluid complications, hearing loss. It's more that's more specific to, to an extent, you know, to a lesser fever, seizures and um, confusion. So that makes it a more, more of a probable case. But suspect, suspected case just when somebody, when uh, some, so, so the, a patient present with fever lasting more than you know, you know, three days, you know, maybe 21 days and all that. And then you will uh, uh, begin to suspect. And when the patient begins to have some, some complications, you know, like hearing loss, that becomes more, more of a probable case. And then with respect to the pathogenesis, I didn't actually go down to, you know, bring it up because of time and uh, a lot of slides I have here. So um, I can't really be able to uh, say that clearly now, maybe uh, police in a, Infectious disease can actually help us out. I didn't go to the view recently. All right. Thank you so much. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. I noticed that for the probable case, there's a, there may be a history of contact with, with the, another probable case, but in a suspected case. I don't think you put that history of contact. All right. 
right. So thanks to you from Dr. Rita Lacos. Thank you. And then Dr. Momodo says, thanks so much. Death from Lassa generally occurs between 10 and 14 days after symptom onset and is attributed to diminished effective circulating volume, shock, and multi-organ system failure. Thank you, Dr. Momodo. Dr. Olala can say, thank you for the presentation. Good morning. Uh, how long do you follow up a confirmed Lassa fever case after completion of treatment? And there was a treatment regimen for pregnant patients, for pregnant patients. Do you want to make a comment on that? Okay, I think we lost him. Oh, I think we lost him. Okay, I don't know. Hello. He's not in class. I think he has some mental challenges. Yes, ma'am. Those infectious diseases can, uh, can come in and help. I know Mustafa Mohammed is in infectious disease, but he's not in class. So I'm not sure if any other person. Please, if you're in infectious disease, you can help to answer some of these questions, please. I think it's back now. Okay. Dr. Corey, I don't know if you can hear us. Guess is having some challenges. Um, but okay. Doctor, okay. Okay. is there any question that has not been addressed? Okay, so there was a question on um the uh, the regimen for pregnant women. Okay, so if I may just add to attempt that. Okay, so for the modified McCormick uh, regimen for pregnant women, I think the loading dose on day one. Can give hundred milligram per kg in two divided doses. That's two third of it starts, and then one third after eight hours. Unlike the one for non-pregnant women, where you do thirty-three milligram per kg starts. But for pregnant women, you do hundred milligram in two divided doses, hundred milligram per kg, and then on days two to five, it's just the same thing: sixty milligram per kg, six hourly, on day, and then on days six to ten. Eight milligram per kg, eight hourly. Okay, I think the difference is in the loading dose for the modified macomic regimen for pregnant women. Okay, so the other question was um, how long do you follow up a confirmed Lassa fever case after completion of treatment? That was the second question. Recording in progress. I think um, he's back on. Hello. Okay. okay. Hello. We can hear you. Hello. Look at it. Are you? Are you? Are you back on? <laughs> okay, you're here now. Okay. Okay, chief, you're here now. Okay, please go ahead. Hello, Selena. Uh, 
I think his network is still poor. Okay. He's not prepared to join the class. And network is bad. Okay. Okay, so um, if I may attempt the other question too, uh, I think it can, follow, it can follow up the patients weekly for the first three weeks and then monthly for the next three months. And um, I think also the follow-up also how frequently it will depend on um, how well the patient improved after your um, therapy. And then for, for meals, they should also be tested after three months because um, sometimes the virus tends to persist in semen till even after three months of a recovery. I think um, after discharge, can follow up weekly and then maybe three monthly. And then the test, you should repeat the test after 10 days. That's 10 days after treatment to find out if the patient is um, uh, negative. Okay, so that's, I don't know if any other person has something to add to that. Thank you, Dr. Keller. I don't know. I don't need any more comments from the participants before we move to our teachers. Those going for the exam, we need to hear your voice. I believe you've attempted this question before on your own. So please, I want to um, implore you to kindly share your knowledge with your colleagues. So Twekeda has done well. So Kure, Nonada has done well. Otherwise, a discussion. Let's hear your voice. Let's hear your input. The official disease guys are not in class. Okay, it's fine. Thank you, Dr. Ekare, for coming in to help Dr. Okori. I don't know if Dr. Okori is in class already. Thank you for your wonderful attempt. Thank you so much. I think he's trying to join. Thank you. I appreciate. I don't need any comments from our teachers. Any comments from our teachers? Okay, that's fine. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Dr. Kuri is in class. I think his, his network, we won't um, network is terrible. So it's been quite a wonderful day. Both presenters did well. Thank you. 